The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have Delegate Mark Cole with us here today. Good to see you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Delegate Cole chairs the Privileges and Elections uh, Committee. I think it's the oldest standing yes, committee is. in the House of Delegates. Yes, it is the, uh, the oldest uh, committee in the House of Delegates. Uh, you know, we deal with uh, campaign and, and election law and uh, constitutional issues as well. Great. Tell us a little bit about your district. It, it encompasses both parts of uh, Spotsylvania and Stafford counties? That's correct. Uh, my, my district is the 88th and it uh, kind of uh, runs along the Route 3 and Route 17 corridors. I've got parts of the city of Fredericksburg Spotsylvania County, Stafford, and then Fauquier County as well. So how's the economy doing in, in your district? Uh, it, it's going along. It's not as good as it, it could be uh, and should be, uh, but uh, you know it's, it's not as bad as uh, some of the other parts of the state or the country. Um, you know, we're, I'm hopeful that the new administration will mm -hmm. you know, get some of the burdens off of small businesses because that's, I think, been the, the real issue with job creation. Historically, small businesses have accounted for about 75% mm -hmm. of new job creation, and, and they're the ones that have the hardest time dealing with the new laws sure. and new regulations. And, and uh, actually, for the past several years, uh, you know, small businesses have actually been going out of business faster than they've been created, and that, that's just not a good good indicator for the economy. Now what about the housing market? We know there was a big mm -hmm. recession back yeah. in 2008. Has yeah. the housing market started it, to come it, back? It's slowly coming back. I think uh, property values have, have uh, come back somewhat. Uh, you know, and you're starting to see at the local level a little bit more interest in, in new buildings and, and things like that. So it is slowly coming back, uh, but it's nowhere near what it was during the boom you know, say eight, ten years ago. Have have values uh, been raised? Has, has the yeah, they have. They have come up, uh, up. You know, uh, almost to to what they were before the crash, uh, which which will help uh, local governments because right. the localities uh, depend on property taxes uh, for most of their their revenues. So uh, so that that will help uh, local governments. Um. Now, who are some of the major employers in, in, in your district? Oh, well, uh, GEICO mm -hmm. is, is a, a, probably the one of the biggest. Uh, then you have a lot of the service industries, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, the uh, uh, retail businesses, right. the, the Spotsylvania Mall, uh, mm -hmm. Central Park, and, and those areas are, are uh, and, and Celebrate Virginia. Uh, those areas are kind of the, the main economic drivers locally, um, but uh, probably most of our uh, workers in, in my district commute. Uh, you know, most of the people in the area, they commute up to uh, Northern Virginia or D.C. for the jobs, and I know that's been a real focus on uh, in local government is to try to create uh, employment opportunities that are local so people don't have to get on the road to commute to work every day. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, change in administration in Washington and there, there are high hopes, especially in terms of sequestration, which is unfortunately still on the books. It's had yeah. a major negative impact yeah. to the Commonwealth. Talk, talk about that. Well, it, it has been tough because so much of our uh, economy in our area in Northern Virginia depends on the federal government either direct federal employees, the military, and, and contractors, and, and support personnel. Uh, so it's, it has been tough whenever the federal government, uh, you know, clamps down on spending. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's why we're trying to diversify our economy and bring in uh, other employers and other opportunities, because uh, when, when the federal government's running 
big deficits. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't keep running these deficits forever and not have a negative impact. So uh, regardless of who's in the White House, I, I think federal spending is going to have to be gotten under control. And that's why we need to try to diversify our economy so we're not so dependent on the federal government. Uh, you know, we'll always have, I think, a, a large group of federal employees and military and, and workers in our area. You know, we got Quantico right, right, right. there and Dahlgren and, and AEP Hill. Uh, so that will always be probably a, a prime driver of our, our economy, but we'll, we've got to try to diversify the economy, not just in our area, but statewide, so that uh, we're not so dependent on, on federal spending. Uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, a number of residents in Stafford and Spotsylvania County commute north. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are starting to use those hot lanes. Are mm -hmm. you... Uh, getting complaints about those hot lanes? Yeah, the, when they when they first came down, it, it was kind of a bait and switch. Uh, you know, when they originally were proposing the idea, they said they were going to build them all the way down to Massaponics right. in Spotsylvania. And somehow when the <clears throat> previous uh, administration in Richmond negotiated the contract with the, uh, the, the company, they, they ended it right there at 610 in North Stafford. Mm -hmm. And that, that's been a, a real mess. Uh, you know, we did get them now. VDOT is, is uh, a, going to extend it a few miles uh, to try to break that bottleneck at 610. Uh, but, and then eventually it, it needs to go further south, uh, I think eventually all the way to Massaponics like it was originally proposed to do. Uh, anywhere you have the, well, while it helps overall reduce commute times, but wherever it ends, uh, you're always going right. to have that bottleneck right. uh, unless you get it further south where, where the traffic volumes are less. Now, to what extent do, do people use uh, uh, rail, for example? There's a new uh, Virginia Railroad Express station right off of Route 17. I yeah, in, in Spotsylvania, they, they uh, opened uh, the, uh, the new VRE station. Uh, more than a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, so that's been uh, being utilized quite quite heavily. Uh, VRE uh, I think is a, a good value because it takes the the equivalent of a lane of traffic off of I-95. So that is certainly I think a, a, a part of our our transportation solutions, uh, trying to mitigate the traffic on 95. Uh, but it's going to be uh, a multi-pronged mm -hmm. approach. Uh, you know, we've got to, uh, there's, there's uh, projects to uh, in expand the capacity uh, on 95 uh, going across the Rappahannock. I know uh, Stafford and Spotsylvania are looking at uh, projects to try to improve access uh, to 95. And, uh, and, you know, really, you know, that, that whole corridor Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a, a combination of expanding the current capacity as far and also expanding rail. Um, you know, there, there's uh, looking at uh, building another rail line. Uh, you know, a, mm -hmm. along the corridor because the the rail lines people don't realize it, but the rail lines uh, are almost as gridlocked as, sure. as 95 is, and and we've got to just expand more capacity between, you know, the R area and, and the D.C. area. Uh, back to local government for a moment, mm -hmm. because there's been a, a, a lot of dialogue around short-term rentals, uh, Airbnb, mm -hmm. uh, for example. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've seen much of that in, in either Stafford or Spotsylvania County, and local governments want part of that revenue. Yeah, yeah, and there has been... Uh, you know, this is uh, where people are just renting out either rooms or their homes on a short-term basis uh, to try to generate some some income for themselves, and uh, and then there's the the question of you know you you have the uh, the traditional hotels and motels that say hey these these guys are taking our business uh, and they don't have to pay all the taxes and fees and everything that we have to pay, and so uh, that is uh, you know it's kind of a just a symptom of a, of a new evolving economy, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like Uber and Lyft yes. were with the, yes. the taxi industry, you know, and, and uh, with the internet and technology now, almost anybody can put something on the internet and say, hey, you know, 
if you want to spend a night in my house, it'll I'll charge you fifty bucks. You know, let me know. And and uh, and so you know, they're they're trying to. A lot of local governments are trying to grapple with that. How do you how do you treat them? Do you treat them like they're a hotel mm -hmm. or or what? And uh, and so uh, you know they're still grappling with that. Uh, and I think. Like I said, you know, the economy is going to continue to evolve and change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's just different ways of providing services and, and goods to people now, and uh, and you know, government, uh, you know, is kind of always a few steps behind in reacting to that. Yeah, I guess there are a set of principles you mentioned, uh, Uber and Lyft, and of course, uh, you and others struggled with that balance mm -hmm. uh, between the incumbent and the new entrant. What kinds of things do you have to take into consideration? Well, you, you want to uh, try to have a, a level playing field for, for all participants. You don't want government to be in the business of favoring one guy over another or one industry over another. You want to try to get government out of the way mm -hmm. so they can compete. And, you know, if you compete in a free market, you know, you're more likely to get the, uh, the best quality service at the lowest price. Uh, and so that's that's the real challenge is, is uh, you know, you, you've got this sometimes very cumbersome and overly right. regulatory bureaucratic, you know, uh, government in there that's trying to grapple with with this new economy. And, you know, the complaint is from from the old established businesses, mm -hmm. hey, you're, you're treating us unfairly or you need to put the same burdens on these new guys. And, uh, and maybe we need to reduce burdens on everybody mm -hmm. and let, mm -hmm. let the free market decide, uh, you know, who, who's the winner and loser instead of government trying to pick sure. it. Sure. Uh, let's talk budget. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're in the final what, week and a half now of this short session in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about, about the House budget and what the major differences are that you see with the, uh, the Senate version. Well, there, there's... Uh, there are some minor differences. Uh, I think overall we did a pretty good job dealing with the, the budget shortfall. Uh, we came in here having to cut uh, about $1.2 billion out of the budget, which is, is not an insignificant cut, but it, it's not percentage-wise, it's not a huge amount. Uh, and I think uh, the House proposal, uh, we've done, I think, fairly well. In, in cutting out, uh, you know, the, making the spending reductions we need to make without affecting core services and without raising taxes and fees. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we've got money in there to provide additional funds for education, uh, also to try to address uh, some concerns with law enforcement, sheriff's departments, and the state police are, are having a hard time in a lot of areas, so there's uh, money in there trying to address uh, their concerns. Uh, the state police are really in bad shape. Uh, you know, they've got uh, I think over 200 openings. But, uh, their their salaries just have not kept pace. Uh, nowadays, a, a state trooper, in a lot of cases, can make more money going to work for a local sheriff or police department than he can uh, stay in a, a state trooper. So we are work trying to address those issues. 200 openings and still uh, losing a lot of state yeah, police yeah. to North Carolina, for example, and to some local jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and even our sheriff's department, uh, you know, I know uh, uh, they're having a hard time hanging on to deputies, too. Uh, There's this concept of compression of their salaries? Yes, uh, you know, uh, compression is, is where you have someone who's a, a, you know, a senior deputy been there for years and you know he's not making much more money than he did when he started mm -hmm. and you know you have uh, you know new deputies coming in making just about what he's making and so you know uh, obviously you, you, you want to pay for that uh, extra experience and, and extra efficiency that comes with that and uh, and kind of reward their longevity and their service uh, and uh, so we're, we're trying to grapple with that as well. So as I understand it, there's a significant move to raise those salaries and deal with compression. Teachers will receive a raise, but it won't be as much as law enforcement. Yeah, and, and everything's still being negotiated yet. Nothing's in, in concrete. Uh, you know, that'll be the, probably the last thing we, de right. we uh, decide on 
before we adjourn is the the state budget but uh, you know the house uh, approach they're taking with as far as like teachers and stuff is they're they're just giving more money to the local schools and telling local schools you decide where you need to spend it. Now, is that done through lottery proceeds? Part of it is lottery proceeds, and part of it is uh, education funding. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the normal education funding, and uh, I think that's a better approach mm -hmm. because uh, the General Assembly doesn't set the local teacher salary. That's done by the local school board, and you, you have uh, you know a wide variety depending on what part of the state you live in as to as to what the the teachers' pay is, and uh, and so I think uh, the better approach is to just give the localities, the local school districts, say, hey, this is your money. You take it. You decide where it needs to best be spent. Whether that's teachers' raises, whether that's some other uh, classroom instruction or something like that. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in, in you know, given localities right. uh, the flexibility to, to solve their own problems. Uh, you know, you, I, I don't like us being micromanaged mm -hmm. from Washington, and uh, I don't think we should micromanage localities from Richmond either. Now, what about those school districts, for example, in the rural areas, Coalfield, Southside, mm -hmm. South West Virginia, who have suffered significant declines in enrollment, and therefore the state contribution has been reduced significantly? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very challenging situation where you have a declining enrollment, uh, and, but it's not you know, such a big decline where you can start shutting schools down right you know so you you, you and you're getting less because uh, the a lot of the state funding is on a on a per student basis you know and when you so you'll be getting less money but you may have uh, like, like I said not enough of a decline to shut a school down uh, and so that's particularly a challenge they are trying to uh, address that with some special funding for uh, for areas that are in in that uh, situation uh, a lot of the uh, the rural and southwest uh, areas are really struggling with the uh, the economy, and that just kind of ripples throughout the area, including their schools. Yeah, I've, I've heard of a 10-10-10 program. If you've suffered significant mm -hmm. declines over the last 10 years of a at ten per, at the ten percent level, yeah, yeah. and if you're a school district with less than ten thousand students, yeah. I think that aid may be forthcoming. Yeah, yeah, there is, uh, uh, you know funding for something like that but again we're still negotiating so right. uh, so you know uh, we'll see what the final budget is in, in uh, the next week and a half now you I know you just came from a meeting of the Education Committee and there's been a been a lot of work there as well mm -hmm. talk to us about some of the things going on with with your caucus virtual schools for example yes yeah and uh, that's something that I, I think uh, you know, I, I know it scares uh, some of the, the schools and teachers, the idea of virtual schooling, but uh, that, that's going to be the prime uh, driver in the future is taking advantage of all this new technology in order to deliver uh, educational services. Uh, so we are pushing virtual schools that would allow not just kids at home to, to participate and take classes you know through the internet mm -hmm. but also schools different schools could uh, offer classes virtually that they wouldn't normally offer and this would be on a statewide basis yeah, someone yeah, could take advantage st of that. statewide basis uh, and we're also trying to encourage lo local schools to kind of have their own virtual training or education program as well uh, and so uh, you know uh, yeah I, I think the Traditional school model will be with us at least for the rest of my lifetime, but mm -hmm. but uh, you know more and more, just like the economy is shifting more and more to the internet and online, uh, education is is doing the same thing. Yeah, and, and when you think about it, it also would assist those parents who want to homeschool That's their, their children yeah. as well. Yeah. Now I believe it's uh, Delegate Dave LaRock had, had a bill dealing with education savings accounts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that that would uh, you know uh, again uh, it's part of an educational choice program where uh, if parents uh, and the, the his was limited to uh, special needs mm -hmm. students or uh, uh, students that have been having discipline problems or uh, have uh, uh, have been having struggling passing the uh, the standards of learning test. 
but it would allow those parents in those uh, situations to apply uh, for either some kind of uh, tutoring or uh, private schooling, uh, that type of, of uh, choice, uh, to, and, the, and the state money it wouldn't affect local money, the state money would uh, follow the student. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I think educational choice will, uh, will in the long run save the taxpayers' money and provide a, a better service for the students, especially in areas uh, where the children or the schools are struggling. Now, you mentioned the standards of learning. I understand that the reforms uh, are being implemented at K through 12. Are they starting to migrate yet to our high schools? Yeah, we're, we, there's a working group that is continuously looking at uh, the standards of learning test. Uh, those are the tests in the public schools to uh, kind of gauge how schools are doing. And uh, we're continuously looking at those every year. We have uh, legislation to tweak that. Uh, as a couple years ago, we significantly reduced the amount of tests. Uh, mm -hmm. We're also now allowing, uh, you know, uh, substitution of other standardized tests. Uh, and so we're, we are continuously looking at that. Uh, you know, I know uh, some, you know, parents and teachers complain about, well, the, you know, you're always testing, but, I mean, Ever since I was in school, we've always had tests. You know, it just depends on on uh, what kind of test, whether it's a local class or a standardized test, and um, you know how else are you going to measure whether or not the the school is fulfilling its responsibility uh, in providing a quality education uh, to the students if you don't test them. You also mentioned choice. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been a dialogue for a number of years about. Uh, Charter schools. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The Commonwealth lags far behind yeah. most other states. I think we may have a total of six to eight. The, yeah. the national average, is, I believe, is 120. Yeah, yeah. Now, and that's an area, you know, because it's it's uh, the the uh, authority rests with the local school board if they want to establish a uh, a, a charter school. Uh, we've tried to do it at the state level, but you know the the constitution, state constitution, right. really vests the authority with the uh, local school boards, uh, and so I mean that that's a challenge. Uh, I'm not sure that there'll be any quick fix for that uh, because it really is up to the local elected school boards as to whether or not they feel they a, a charter school would be in their best interest. Uh, I think in, in certain uh, circumstances they, they pr probably do need to be used, especially in areas where, where schools are struggling and students are struggling. Uh, charter schools can really help uh, you know, turn things around. More choice and therefore more competition as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about high school dual enrollment with community colleges? Do you see much of that happening yet in yeah, your district? Yeah, yeah, we are. We do have some legislation to try to expand that and uh, and make it uh, more acceptable as far as our, our four-year uh, colleges and universities to uh, try to standardize that. Some of them have different rules on these dual enrollment enroll courses. But I think it's it's one a way to reward a, uh, a high performing student in high school, and also let them start earning college credits at a, a greatly reduced cost. Uh, you know, higher education costs ha has been a major concern, right. and these dual enrollment uh, you know uh, mm -hmm. courses are a way to kind of chip away at that a, at least a little bit. And I think uh, in terms of uh, those uh, uh, costs. Uh, that continue to rise. Uh, doesn't the majority leader uh, Kirk Cox have a bill that uh, uh, addresses that issue? Yeah, we're 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 trying to address it. Uh, you know, and and put a kind of a some parameters on on uh, the uh, tuition increases. Uh, the the problem with at least some of our our universities have been that. Uh, you know, when we went through the uh, recession, uh, you know, we had to cut right. spending. Uh, they got some of their, their state funding cut. Instead of going back and looking at their organization and seeing if they could streamline and cut their organization, some of them just raised their tuition. And uh, that just put more of a burden on our, you know, the parents and, and students themselves. So now you have these kids coming out of college with these huge 
mm -hmm. uh, student loans, uh, and, and the economy is still struggling, so they're having a hard time finding jobs to, to make their, their loan payments. It's almost like them having a mortgage mm -hmm. when they, as soon as they yes. graduate, but they don't have a home. Uh, and so, uh, so that's a real struggle. And we've got to try to, uh, I think, force these universities uh, to look at themselves and see if mm -hmm. they can't cut some of their costs and streamline uh, their programs so that they, they provide uh, you know, a good quality product at, at a lower price. Uh, lots of action on your committee, privileges and elections. Yeah. Uh, and people don't realize that in between the 10 year period when redistricting occurs, there, there are a lot of things. I know you have a technical amendment dealing with some yeah. of the House and Senate yeah. districts. Uh, you know, what, what we try to do is after the, like you said, every 10 years we do major redistricting. Uh, we're required to do that, uh, you know, uh, in order to balance the populations of the districts uh, because uh, different parts of the state grow at different rates over the decade and so you end up with some districts that have a lot of people and some that have mm -hmm. few and so every 10 years after the census we have to go in and, and rebalance the districts basically. And um, you know, uh, after that we do that we normally make some minor adjustments because at the same time we're doing redistricting at the state level local governments are doing their own redistricting mm. and local governments are the ones that draw the precinct boundaries and so you end up with split precincts uh, mm -hmm. that makes uh, it tougher to run an election and stuff like that so you know I've, I've tried to get legislation through to try to reduce the number of split precincts and uh, and also while we're talking about redistricting there's been a, a group that's really been pushing for uh, redistricting reform their, their stated goal is to try to reduce the politics mm -hmm. I involved in the process. I'm not sure there's a way to do that. You know, they, they push this uh, independent commission, right. but then the politics comes into right. who gets appointed to the commission, right. who makes the appointments and things like that. So I'm not sure that it takes the politics out of it. All it does is make it less transparent. Uh, but, uh, you know, they've really been pushing hard to try to get something passed now. Uh, we're not doing redistricting again until 2021, and there are current court cases pending right. that are going to affect redistricting. So there's no need for us to, to rush into redistricting now. We've, it's still four years away. Uh, we need to just sit back and wait, uh, let the courts uh, make their rulings because those could very well impact what we can and can't consider in redistricting. Great. Well, thank you for being here, Delegate Marco. Good All to right. see you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Cable Reports brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm.